So I'd like to introduce our presenters today. First, we have Dr. Tim Carpenter, who received his PhD in molecular and cellular biochemistry from the University of Oxford. <laughs> Joining him is Dr. Nick Bay, who got his PhD from Johns Hopkins University in cellular and molecular medicine. And unfortunately, Dan Burns was unable to join us today, but Ms. Erin McKay from Tracy High School has graciously stepped in for us. And she got her bachelor's degree from UC Davis. So let's get started. Thank you, Joanna. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Um, so this is the title of our talk, and it may seem a little cryptic, but what we're going to talk about today, myself and Nick, is some of the methods that we use at, at Lawrence Livermore to optimize how medicines can get into your brain. And we do that using experimental methods and also computational methods. So first things first, a little bit about myself. Uh, my dad is a chemistry teacher. So growing up, he managed to instill in me this this appreciation and this curiosity in a, uh, for science. And so hopefully I can do that to a few of you today. Um, secondly, we're in the US, we're in Livermore. I live in Livermore, and I work for a US government national lab. But you may have noticed that I'm not actually American. I am British, which means I say all sorts of strange, funny words, like boot, and torch, and petrol, and computational biophysicist, which is me. So the second goal of this talk is to hopefully, <laughs> by the end, you'll have a, uh, somewhat of an understanding of what a computational biophysicist does. And I am joined here today with my partner in crime, Nick. Thanks, Tim. So I'm Nick. I'll be Tim's counterpart for the day. Uh, I'm also one of the scientists at Lawrence Livermore. And being a scientist, as you might be aware of or familiar with, it does require some training. So going through college or grad school, if you decide to do that, uh, but you may not be aware of you know, exactly what that looks like. So I decided to bring along uh, a picture of myself uh, during my training where I did nothing but work and put in effort and practice day after day, night after night uh, to be a rock star. So <clears throat> when ultimately that didn't pan out, I had to pick a more glamorous position uh, as a scientist. And that's what we're going to talk to you about today. So, Drugs are used to treat illnesses, diseases, disorders in many different organ systems throughout the body. And if you're trying to create a drug that can treat an illness, treat a disease, one of the things that you need to think about is getting the drug to the place where it needs to be. So if you have something you need to treat in a particular organ, you need the medicine to get it where it's actually going to be at. So you might take something by mouth that would go down to your stomach, then gets distributed through your bloodstream, and hopefully gets to the place where it needs to be, like maybe your kidneys, if you have an illness that's related to your kidneys. What we're going to talk about today is the brain. And your brain is indeed special. So your brain doesn't regenerate as quickly as other organ systems in your body. You, know, you don't have the capacity to recover from injury in your brain as quickly as other organ systems in your body. And because your brain is special, your brain has particular mechanisms to protect it. And one of those mechanisms that we're going to talk about today is the blood-brain barrier. And that's just kind of exactly what it sounds like. It's a barrier that exists between your bloodstream and your brain. The reason that that's important is that there's actually a lot of blood in your brain. So you need a lot of blood vessels in your brain to get all of the things that your brain needs and craves. So whether that's nutrients or oxygen or anything else, your brain needs to have access to that bloodstream. This is actually a cast of the vascular system that is all of the blood vessels that are contained inside of your brain. And this is an actual model where they inject a liquid resin into a brain and then that hardens. And then when you remove the tissue, you can actually see what those vessels look like. So these are the actual vascular system, the vasculature, what we call it, of the brain system. And you can see the larger vessels at the base extending to the smaller vessels at the outside. So the reason the blood-brain barrier is important is that you don't necessarily want everything in the blood, everything that's floating around in the blood, to be capable of getting into the brain. Because again, your brain is special, and you want to be able to protect it. So what does that actually look like on a cellular scale? 
So this is an image, an animation of what a blood vessel looks like, maybe just anywhere in your body, in an average organ system, kidney, liver, skin, that you might have somewhere else in your body, not the brain. Up on top, we have the red blood, red blood cells flowing through the vessel, and in yellow, we have a drug molecule that you might have taken for a particular illness. So normally, you have spaces in between the cells that coat these blood vessels. So if you take a drug, it can go between the cells and get to the tissue where it needs to be, and so you have enough drug in the, func in the area where it actually needs to function. But again, your brain is special, and it has particular mechanisms to protect it. So instead of these big spaces in between the cells, they're filled with special proteins that form structures called tight junctions. And these actually do just exactly what you think they might do. They sit tightly in between the cells, and they block those spaces so that if you have a drug that, doesn't, that isn't intended to get into the brain, then it just kind of bounces off those junctions, and it doesn't go anywhere. Now, what are we to do if we actually need to get a drug into the brain to treat an illness that has to do with the brain? We can design something that instead of going between the cells, it actually goes through the cells. So it goes through the outside, that membrane of the cell, which you might be familiar with from a biology class, a cell membrane or a plasma membrane, to actually get to the brain where it needs to be. So if we want to design a drug that's capable of doing that, we have to understand that membrane. We have to understand how it interacts with its surroundings and how it interacts with a potential drug molecule. And to talk to you a little bit about what is involved in that and what we need to know about those membranes, uh, Tim is going to continue. Thank you, Nick. So as Nick mentioned, because of these tight junctions between the cells, in order to get a, uh, a medicine into the brain, it has to go through the cell. It has to cross the membrane, go through the cell, and out the other side. So if you think of a cell, most of the inside of the cell is water, and most of the outside of the cell is also water. So the membrane has to act as a barrier to water. And it does that by building on two chemical principles and, and two features of chemicals called whether they are hydrophobic or hydrophilic. And hydrophobic means that those compounds really don't like water. Hydrophilic, on the other hand, means they really like water. So other features of compounds with these properties is that hydrophobic drugs really like hanging out with hydrophobic drugs, and hydrophilic drugs really like hanging out with other hydrophilic drugs, but they really, really dislike each other. So much so that if you had a big mixture of them all jumbled up together, they would be extremely stressed, extremely unhappy, because they, they you know, it's like, it's like if you had a bunch of uh, Dodgers fans and a bunch of Giants fans together. They're, they're not going to have a good time. So if you leave them long enough, they reorganize so that you have all of the hydrophilic molecules and all of the hydrophobic molecules, and now they're a lot happier. And to do, give us, uh, show us a practical demonstration of the properties of hydrophilic and hydrophobic in, in, uh, in a real presentation, we'll pass it over to, to Erin. Here. First of all, I've got some demos that we're going to do, so I've got to put on my proper personal protective equipment, button up the lab coat, otherwise it doesn't do any good. You know, it just looks nice. Take off the regular glasses, put on the safety glasses, glove up. Okay, so hydrophobic, hydrophilic, water loving, water hating. It's one of the few times opposites don't attract. So we got a couple of demos here. So we got ooh, a Sharpie. Now, how many of you have ever used a Sharpie? Many of you? Yeah. Hydrophobic or hydrophilic? If you accidentally spill water on it, it's still labeled. So it is hydrophobic. So I've taken a nice coffee filter, drawn a nice little circle on it. Now, I could put it in water and just show you that it's hydrophobic and nothing happens, but that's kind of boring. So instead, I took something that it likes, alcohol, rubbing alcohol. So if we put it in here, we'll see, give it enough time, that the, water, uh, the alcohol will run up the coffee filter paper, and ooh, is the Sharpie soluble? in rubbing alcohol. Now, to show you the opposite side, 
vis-a-vis -vis pens are the pens that you sometimes use in the classroom when you write on something and then you use a little damp paper towel and wipe it back off. So is it hydrophobic or hydrophilic? Hydrophilic. It loves water. So done the same thing. Okay, drawn a nice little circle. And on a coffee filter, make sure I get the label on the right side. And now we're going to put it in water to show that it does indeed the ink loves water. So one ink loves water, one ink loves growing alcohol, because water is hydrophilic. I would hope water would love itself. Okay, so that's going to take a little bit of time to run. Let me just move this out of the way. And we have. Hmm, I wonder which one is a hydrophobic solution and which one's a hydrophobic solution. Hmm, I'll tell you. That's corn oil, and that's just water with a little blue dye to make it easier to see. Now I have this mystery solution. I wonder whether it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic. When we pour it in, we'll see which layer it goes to, and that'll tell us whether it's hydrophobic or hydrophilic, because they like to hang out together. So, pour it in. Give it a moment. What do you think? Hydrophobic or hydrophilic? <laughs> Very good. It's just red blue dye in water. Okay, and I think by now we've got just enough chromatography happening that we can actually see. Ooh, wait, Sharpie's not really black, it's a mixture of colors. So if we take it off, we can see that the colors have begun to separate and use the purple. So, hydrophobic ink, rubbing alcohol is its friend. Vis-a-vis -vis pen, not quite as pretty. It's brown and blue, but Water soluble, our water does the job. So, water likes hydrophilic substances and hangs out together, and oil is a hydrophobic substance. Turn it back to you. Thank you, Aaron. Okay, so now we know uh, what makes things hydrophobic, what makes them hydrophilic. Now let's talk about the cell membrane. So first of all, on the left, just have an image of water that some of you may know is, is H2O, where you have two hydrogen atoms in white and one oxygen atom in the, the red ball. And on the right-hand side, we have this strange-looking molecule called a lipid. Now a lipid is what makes up your cell membrane. And lipids are really interesting because one end, called the head, is hydrophilic. But the other end, called the tails, those are hydrophobic. So it has both properties within one molecule. So what happens if you mix these two together? You have all the water molecules surrounding the lipid. And because water molecules only really like things that are hydrophilic and vice versa, most of the water molecules that are interacting with the tails are really unhappy. They have to interact with these hydrophobic tails. So what happened if you have hundreds and thousands and millions of these lipid molecules together in water. Well, what they can do is they can try and aggregate. They can try and join together to minimize the amount of interaction between the tails and the water. And that's exactly what happens. You have one lipid in water. It's not really happy. The tails have to make lots of interactions. Another one comes along. Now the tails can interact with each other rather than, than with the water. So this process repeats and repeats and repeats, until eventually you end up with this structure called a bilayer, meaning there's one layer on top and there's one layer on the bottom. And now the lipids, lipid tails are only interacting with each other. They're both hydrophobic, so they like doing that, and the only part of the molecule that is interacting with water is the hydrophilic head. So everyone's happy. And this is the structure of a cell membrane. You have water on the outside, you have the, the cell membrane, which is hydrophobic in the middle, and you have water inside the cell. So again, this is how it, it looks relative to the cell. 
keeps everything inside the cell that needs to stay there, and it keeps things outside the cell. So when we're trying to optimize a medicine or a drug molecule, there are two things we have to consider. The effectiveness of that drug is its activity, how well it works at doing its job. But the other thing to consider is its accessibility. How well, how easily, how fast does it get to that target? And again, this is kind of uh, the, the issue with developing these, these compounds to get into the brain is that a lot of them, their accessibility is very poor. They can't get into the brain because of the blood-brain barrier. If you have a drug molecule that's hydrophilic and it needs to get to another uh, drug target that's hydrophilic on the other side of the membrane, it can't get there. There's this hydrophobic barrier, the cell membrane, in the middle. So it doesn't really work very well. So one solution is to take this hydrophilic drug molecule and add another small bit onto it. Now we add something that is hydrophobic. So now the drug molecule has some hydrophilic properties and some hydrophobic properties. So this allows it to cross the membrane and get to its target. But there's a fine balance here. If you make this hydrophobic part too big, now the drug molecule may actually prefer to just stay in the membrane, or it may travel through the membrane very, very slowly. And the speed at which it travels through the membrane is what we call permeability. Something that's more permeable will go through the membrane a lot easier, a lot faster. Something that's very poorly permeable will take a lot longer to go through the membrane. And something that doesn't go through the membrane at all is called impermeable. And finally, the other thing we have to think about is the type of hydrophobic part that we add onto our drug. Because we could add something onto it that makes it great at getting through the membrane, but means that once it gets to its target, it suddenly is not able to work properly. So this, uh, this is kind of like if you have some chores to do at home and your chore is to mow the lawn. You could go out and get the world's best lawnmower. Yeah, it's easy, right? You just sit on it, it does most of the work. The problem is your lawn is behind a picket fence with a very small gate. And this thing weighs about two tons. You're not lifting it over the fence, you're not getting it through the gate. You have the world's best lawnmower, but it's useless because you can't get it to the lawn. So the alternative is to have something that's perhaps not quite as good. It still does the job, but it's light enough, it's small enough, you can pick it over the fence, pick it over the picket fence, or you can take it through the, through the gate. But again, you know, we don't want to go too far. I mean, this would be the easiest thing to get to the lawn, and technically you could cut the lawn with this, but I, I would not advise that. Um, so now we're going to have another little practical demonstration about permeability. And this involves audience participation. <laughs> so down here we have Erin, and she is going to be our slightly impermeable molecule. And over here is Nick, and Nick is going to be our very permeable molecule. And everyone up there, you guys are our membrane. No. <laughs> Nick's not really interacting with the membrane, he's going through a lot faster. Eric has to stop and interact with all the other molecules in the membrane. She's making my eyes, making friends, but oh, Nick is actually almost there. <laughs> okay, so Nick is now gone all the way through the membrane, and Eric's still going to stop. Finally. <laughs> Yeah, that was a lot more athletic exertion than I was expecting when they asked me to give this talk. So just quickly take a minute, and then we'll move on. OK, so we've learned a little bit about permeability, and we've learned that if we want to design a drug that gets into the brain, we need to know some more about it. We need to know how well it works, but we also need to know how permeable it is across a membrane. So what are some of the ways that we can try to figure that out? There are a few different tools that we're going to describe to you today, and I'm just going to outline them here in their general categories. So the first tool that we can potentially use to examine a drug compound is an in silico tool. This is a computational tool. So building a computational model of a membrane 
and seeing how a drug compound and how other molecules interact with that membrane. You know, a second tool that we can use is called an in vitro tool. This is where we take what is simulated on the computer and then taking that into actual physical reality. So building that system in the laboratory and actually physically testing something against it. So the third thing that we can do is test in an animal model, in an in vivo system. And so this is where we have the complete biological system. So we're adding a little bit more here at each step. We have a simulated model, and then we have an actual physical system in the laboratory, and then we have a complete biological system that has the brain and the circulatory system and the gastrointestinal system, everything that's associated with what, with parts of an animal or a human that we would need to understand in order to determine whether or not a drug is going to get where it needs to be. So there are a few different pros and cons to each of these systems that govern how we use them and when we use them. So one of the things that we would want to know about each of these tools that you would want to know about really any tool is how well does it work? How accurate is it? The measurements that you take, how accurate are they? So in the computational system, we can get good information, but it's a little bit less accurate than some of the other systems because we don't have something that's actually in physical reality and we don't have all of the components that are in a biological system to interact with that drug. The in vitro system, the experimental system, is a little bit more accurate because we have maybe a simulated and artificial membrane that actually has all of the molecules from a membrane. And the animal system is going to be the most accurate. This in vivo system is going to be the most accurate, again, because we have all of the different components that are going to interact with that drug molecule. Another thing we want to think about is cost. So how much does it cost to run any of these given systems? Now, the computational system is going to be the lowest relative cost because we don't actually have to build any of these drug compounds in order to run this system. We can just simulate them on the computer. And this is a substantial advantage in that we don't have to spend any money trying to make these things. The in vitro system is going to cost a little bit more because we do have to synthesize those drug compounds. We have to ask a chemist to make them. And we have to actually have a physical system that we build in the laboratory. And then the animal system, the in vivo system, is going to be the most expensive of all because we have to have a large infrastructure and team and a lot of effort that goes around to performing those experiments. And the last thing we want to think about is also time. So you want to think about how long is something going to take when you're thinking about how much you can test and how many different things you can test. Now, the computational system, again, is going to be the fastest because you don't actually have to make anything. You can just simulate it on the computer. The experimental system is going to take a little bit longer because you have to make everything and bring it into the laboratory. And then again, the in vivo system is going to be the most, ex the most time consuming because of all the effort that goes into performing these experiments. So one of the advantages to kind of the pros and cons of each of these individual tools in stringing them together is that we can start by testing a lot of different things in the computational system. So even though it's slightly less accurate, we can do things quicker, and we can do them for lower cost. So if we have, say, hundreds of different drug compounds that we think might be effective for treating a particular illness in the brain, we can test hundreds of these on the computer to determine which are the ones that are most likely to use, and which ones do we weed out, which ones do we move forward into a more expensive, a more time-consuming process? So we can just pick maybe some tens of compounds, 20, 30, 40 compounds, that we're going to test in an experimental system. And that's our next cutoff step. So then we can weed a few more out and say, OK, based on what we've predicted on the computer, based on what we've performed in the laboratory, we're just going to pick one or two to perform in the most complex, the most expensive and time-consuming, but most accurate model where we're going to get the best information. And so we don't have to waste resources testing things that we have already predicted or measured as not likely to work effectively. So the first tool here is the computational system. And for that, Tim is going to describe to you a little bit about how everything he talked about in terms of membranes and lipids come into play in the simulations that he's doing. But first, the question you might ask is, what is computational biology, and what exactly do computational biologists do all day? That's a very good question, Nick. Thank you. Yes, so what is a computational biologist, a computational biophysicist? Now, if you think like a computer and biology, they don't really seem like they should go together very well. Um, and I found this cartoon online that I, I think encapsulates some of, some of the perceptions about computational biologists. 
I don't have a lab. I just sit at, uh, in an office. I work on a computer. I can wear whatever I want. There's no restrictions. I can have all the food and drink in my, my office, my lab. Whereas uh, you know, the experimental biologists, they have, they have all these restrictions. They have to wear, as Erin pointed out, you have to wear all the protective gear. You know, there's, uh, you're working with sometimes nasty chemicals and reagents, and you, you're generally walking around looking upset about all these restrictions and the fact that your, your career as a rock star didn't quite go as planned. <laughs> But of course, reality is much, much different. I mean, I often wear a hat. Also, experimental biologists are against men charming, whereas computational biologists just sometimes drink coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so when I talk about computational biology, from my point of view, what I mean is molecular dynamics simulations. No one? No one knows what this is? No. OK. So I'll try and break this down, try and explain what I actually do all day. So molecular dynamics simulations, you can kind of think of this as animations of the biological system at the level of an atom, where the movements of these animations are, are driven of the physics of how those atoms interact with each other. So I'll go through this, break it down uh, step by step, and talk about what I uh, think of by an animation. So an animation is you have a single static image. You kind of move some of it a little bit, and you have another image. You move it a little bit more, you have another image. You do this over and over again, lay all these images on top of each other, and you have something that looks like it's moving. Now, just on a side note, uh, does anyone know what this is? <laughs> Specifically, anyone? So this is thought to actually be the world's first motion picture, where you have a change in position over a change in time. Something is moving, and the movements are related in time. And this was actually taken uh, just down the road in Stanford uh, in 1878, where they, they captured a series of photographs related in time. Uh, and this was to find out whether or not all four legs of a horse left the ground when it was in full gallop. And if you look at the top row, you can see that they did actually prove that all four legs of a horse come off the ground. So an animation, something's changing its position over time. It's a change in position over a change in time. And in the horse, what is driving the change in position was the actual movement of the horse. But in, in what you think of as conventional animation, what is defining the movement, it, it can be the, the animator's imagination. You know, anything is possible. But in our animations, what's defining the movement, what's causing the things to move, is physics. And now I'll get into the really fun part of the talk where I talk about physics. So these physic the physics that we use to drive our animations uh, come from some equations by Sir Isaac Newton, probably best known for discovering gravity when an apple fell on his head. And of course, like all brilliant, famous, handsome scientists, uh, he was British as well. Um, <laughs> so we're going to uh, look at one of his laws of motions, which says that the acceleration of an object is equal to the force exerted on that object divided by the mass of the object. So essentially, the, the harder that you kick a football, oh, sorry, a, uh, a soccer ball, the faster it's going to move. But also, you take mass into account, you're going to have to kick a bowling ball you know, pretty hard to get it to move, which I would not advise. So this equation allows us to find the acceleration of an object. But the definition of acceleration is an object's change in velocity or its speed over a change in time. And in turn, the definition of velocity is a change in position over change in time. This is what we use to define animation. So in order to calculate an atom's animation, its change in position over change in time, we need to know its acceleration. We know the mass of these atoms, so we just need to find the force. Now, how do we go about doing that? OK, does anyone know what this is? <laughs> 
Like I said earlier, yeah, my mom was a chemistry teacher, so I had these like lying around the house all the time. These are like Lego sets for chemistry molecules. The balls are the atoms, the little sticks are the bonds. You can make any molecule in the world using a chemistry set like this, including some of the most important molecules known to man, caffeine and sugar, with, <laughs> which out, without which I would not be here today. So now let's just go back and, and uh, think about the water molecules that we talked about earlier. Water being H2O, so we need to get our one oxygen atom, let's pick that out, and we need two hydrogens. So we're gonna take two hydrogen atoms and bond that onto the oxygen. We now have a water molecule. So now let's consider a system where we just have three of these little water molecules. Three molecules, nine atoms. And we want to calculate what the forces are on all of these atoms. So let's just start with a single hydrogen atom. In order to work out its, its animation, its movement, we need to know the force on that. We need to calculate the net force. And by net force, I mean that you can have two different forces pulling on that, but there's only going to be one resultant direction that it moves. It's like as if there's a, a tug of war on that atom. Two forces are pulling it in both directions, but there's more people on one side, so it's gonna slowly move in that direction. Now when I talk about the different types of forces on these atoms, there are two subcategories. You can either have uh, bonded forces, which are the forces between atoms that are in the same molecule, and then non-bonded forces, how the, the forces between atoms that are in different molecules. So I'll start by talking about these bonded forces. So the bonds here are shown as these these little white lines. But in reality, we treat them kind of closer to springs. And much like springs, these bonds can, can expand and contract. And also much like a spring, if you stretch it out, there's gonna be a force pulling it back together again. And if you compress it, there's gonna be a force pushing it back out. Now, all bonds have an ideal length that they like to be at. If you stretch them longer than that length, they're gonna try and contract like a spring and pull back together. So let's imagine in our system that this bond is slightly overstretched. So there's gonna be a very small force pulling it back. So the other type of, non -bond, of, of bonded forces is the bond angle. The angle between this hydrogen, the oxygen, and the next hydrogen. And just like bonds, they have ideal angles that they like to be at. If you contract the angle, there'll be a force pulling it back if you expand the angle, there'll be another force pulling it back. So again, let's imagine that in our system, our angle is slightly too compressed, meaning there'll be a small force in this direction trying to get back to the ideal angle that it likes to be at. These are the bonded forces. Moving on to the non-bonded forces. So these non-bonded forces mean that all the atoms in the system that are close enough within this dotted line will have an effect on our hydrogen atom. So all atoms have a very weak uh, kind of force towards each other, like their own very tiny little gravitational pull. So all these atoms that are highlighted with a, a, a blue aura will have an effect on our hydrogen atom. There'll be a very weak force pulling that hydrogen atom towards them. So there'll be a net force from those non-bonded interactions in this direction. The final type of force is through charges. All atoms have a, a very small positive or negative charge. They're very, very rarely are they, are they neutral. And as I'm sure you're aware, opposite charges attract each other. Just as the case of this, this negative oxygen is attracting the hydrogen, but also like charges will repel each other. So there'll be forces from those hydrogens pushing our hydrogen in this direction. So these are the forces on our hydrogen as the result of charges, giving a net force that looks like this. So now all we have to do is add up all those forces. We have the non-bonded and the bonded forces. Four different forces pulling on that atom, giving a net force that looks something like this. <laughs> 
We did all those calculations to find out that there's a net force on this atom of a certain size in this direction. You then repeat that for all the other atoms in the system. And now that you know these forces, they have a strength, a magnitude, a size. They also have a direction. So that allows you to say, right, when we animate this, when we go to the next frame, the atoms will move very slightly in those directions. But now their positions have changed, so the forces on them will have changed slightly. And you have to calculate all those uh, forces again, and again, and again, and again, until you have something that looks like motion. But here, the motion, the way that these molecules are moving, is governed and defined purely by the physics and the chemistry of how these atoms interact with each other. So like I said, this is a small system. We have three molecules, nine atoms, and I only did it for about 10 frames. When we run simulations to try and look at drug permeability, our systems are a lot bigger, and we run them for a lot longer. So our systems, we have a cell membrane, just like in reality. We put water on both sides, just like in reality. And then we add in our drug molecule. So a system of this size is about 25,000 atoms. And in order to calculate the net force on all of those 25,000 atoms for one step, one frame, requires about 100 million calculations. Is that one of the questions? <laughs> Maybe hold off on that a little bit. <laughs> and in order to run a simulation long enough to actually see something interesting happen or get enough confidence in our results, the simulation needs not one frame, but 50 million frames. So 25,000 atoms, 100 million calculations for 50 million frames gives five quadrillion calculations. I had, I had to Google this. I didn't know what this number was called. <laughs> so five followed by 15 zeros. So this is why we need a supercomputer to do these. So this is the cartoon of what our simulation system looks like. And this is what it actually looks like. You have the water molecules there, and you can see most of the, hyd most of the, the atoms in all the lipid tails. So this can get a little bit confusing to look at to actually see what's going on. So I'm going to make everything look like a cartoon. But I have to emphasize that this is not a cartoon. Like, when this simulation runs, I have not told this to do anything. Physics has. I just put them close to each other and said, do your thing. And also these kind of wiggly spaghetti worm things, the, the, the lipid tails, there's actually real atoms under all of those. I've just made them look this way so it's easier to see. So we run our simulation, we run our five quadrillion calculations, and this is what we get. So you can see the drug molecule at the top, and you can see water, it kind of goes into the membrane a little bit and then realizes, oh, this is hydrophobic, I don't like this. Turns around and goes back again. And one end of the, water, of the drug molecule in red is hydrophilic, and the other end in blue is hydrophobic. So you always have the hydrophobic end of the molecule pointing into the hydrophobic membrane, and the hydrophilic end of the molecule pointing out into the water. So this is a short example of what these simulations look like. So now I've told you what these, these molecular dynamics simulations are. Now, how do we use them to, to predict the permeability of a molecule? Well, we just stick the drug on one side, right, and, and set our stopwatch and see how long it takes to get to the other side. Unfortunately, it's not quite that easy. Despite the amazing computational power that we have at the lab, it would still just take far too long to actually see this happen in our simulations. And we'd also want to do it uh, a number of times to get some good reliability. So we have to be clever with how we use our resources and how we try and calculate these answers. So it, it, it's kind of like uh, if you want to go out and ride your bike up Patterson Pass, as shown here, and you want to know exactly how much energy it takes to get from the bottom all the way up to the top. So you get a cycling computer, you put it on your bike, and you just cycle up to the top and see what the number says, right? But unfortunately, you know, it, it's, it's really hot outside. You do it in the summer, and it's really, really steep and long, and you're kind of like a slightly out-of-shape scientist with a bad back, and you, you never get to the top. <laughs> 
You never get your answer, so you're frustrated. So one solution is to get some friends. So you all start at different points up the hill. You all have your bike. You all have cycling computers on your bike. All you need to do now to calculate the energy from the bottom all the way up to the top is just cycle from where you started to where the next person started. Then you can take all your cycling computers, add them all up, and you'll have your answer. So this is one of the approaches that we use. Yay, you have your answer. You get to the top. This is one of the approaches that we use at the lab. Instead of just running one simulation and waiting for it to go all the way through, we run hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of simulations all at the same time, where we have the same membrane system, but we just put the drug at a different position in the membrane. So in order to get the permeability for one molecule, it may, takes maybe a day or two on the supercomputers. So say if you want to do a set of maybe 20, 30, 40, you could get that in a couple of months or so using you know, some of the world's fastest computers. To do the same calculations on this laptop over here, it would take 100 years. So again, this is why we need, this is why this method you need supercomputing for. So now I've described what I mean by in silico biology and how we can use that to test a large number of compounds. Like Nick said, we don't have to make them, we don't have to synthesize them. So we can test them in silico uh, using computing. And I can say, right, I have all these possible compounds that we could use. I've predicted this is the top 20%. Then those top 20%, I can then pass on to Nick and he can test them using some of his uh, in vitro methods. Thanks, Tim. <laughs> so now Tim's talked to you a little bit about the incredible techniques that he's using to leverage the supercomputing power that we have at the laboratory. And he's made a few predictions, and he's passed on to us what he thinks is most likely to work. And so we bring them into the laboratory and try to recreate in kind of a physical reality, in an experimental system, what he's just described to you on his computational system. So we also want to create a membrane, test things against it, and see how permeable they're likely to be. So what I have here is what we call a 96-well plate. And this is, you can kind of see how big it is. Within this, you have 96 individual compartments, what we have represented in a cartoon form up here back on the screen. And each of these compartments has two, separate, uh, two separated individual components where we can use, since we are at Lawrence Livermore, we thankfully have a substantial laser budget that we can show you the inside. Yeah? That was for Tim. Tim created this. So all of this applause goes over to Tim. Where we have a two-compartment system that in the middle has our most important component, our membrane. So what we've created here is an artificial membrane that has the components that Tim just described to you. So we have the polar heads on the top and the bottom, and in the middle, we have the hydrophobic tails. And what we want to do is, on the outside, in the outside compartment, which represents, again, the outside of the cell, we have that above the membrane, and then below, we have the inside of the cell, another compartment that represents the inside of the cell. And what we want to do is relatively straightforward. We want to put our drug candidate compounds on the outside of the cell and see how well it permeates through the membrane into the middle of the cell. And what we can do from there is use a variety of analytical chemistry techniques to measure the concentration of the drug outside the cell as well as inside the cell and use that to calculate a rate, essentially how fast do these drug compounds actually get across the membrane. And then we can compare the rates and identify which of these is most likely to be the fastest at getting into the brain when we actually give it to a living organism. So one of the things that is really important when we're using predictions to make decisions about experiments that we're doing is knowing how well do these actually line up. So how well do these predictions actually line up with what we're observing in, exp in an experimental system? So one of the things that we did up front was to take nine compounds represented here and test them in Tim's computational system. We then take the same nine compounds and we test them in an experimental system 
uh, so that they line up. And just you know, so no one's confused, we have pictures here showing myself on the right and Tim over here on the left. <coughs> what we want to do with these compounds after we've taken these measurements is actually put them into categories. So here we have four different buckets. We have up at the top in green, those compounds which are predicted to be the most permeable. And down here at the bottom in red, we have those compounds which are predicted to be impermeable, and then a few in the middle showing slightly or moderately permeable molecules. So we do Tim's predictions, and we see that these are sorted compounds one through four as most permeable, and compounds seven through nine as not permeable at all, and a few in the middle. We do the same tests on the experimental side, and we find that these actually line up really well. So the same compounds go into the same buckets in terms of being very permeable one through four, and not at all permeable in seven through nine. And the order of these compounds, you can see that the one, four, two, three, and the one, two, three, four are actually in a different order. And this is because although the compounds were assigned to the same categories, the exact order did differ slightly. So we predicted compound one in both cases to be the most permeable, but the predictions on the computational side went one, four, two, three, whereas on the experimental side, the order was slightly different. But what we see is that the categories in terms of permeable or not permeable are the same between our predictions that we make and the actual measurements that we take in the lab. And this is really, really important because we don't want to be using our predictions to throw out compounds that actually might work really well in the laboratory. And since we see that our predictions are actually lining up very well with our experimental results, this suggests to us that that won't be the case. And we wanted to quickly show you what these data actually look like when we get the readout. So here on the y-axis, the vertical up and down axis, we have the predictions for permeability. And along the horizontal, the x-axis uh, along the bottom, we have the permeability rate, the speed that was predicted in the laboratory. And these dots are representing the individual compounds that were tested. And what we would want if these predictions line up well with the experimental results is for each of these dots to be really close to the line. And if that's the case, then we would get an R squared value of something that is very close to one. And this is an actual measurement. It's a correlation coefficient that tells us how closely do a set of dots line up with a given line. And what we want is for this to be very close to one, and so we see that 0.97 is very close to one, and so we're very happy. And we can move on with the confidence that the predictions that Tim's making are actually relevant and useful for predicting the compounds that we should be testing experimentally. And th they sort these very well in the upper right-hand side to very permeable compounds and impermeable compounds on the lower left-hand side. So we've talked to you about membranes in terms of the lipids that make them up. But this gets a little bit more complicated, actually, because lipids are not the only thing that sit in membranes. There's a whole bunch of other stuff, proteins and other matrices that sit within, on top, and below membranes. So we don't necessarily want to forget about these because they might impact permeability as well. And one of the most important components that we think about when we're thinking about permeability specifically at the brain are pumps. So the brain is actually enriched for these proteins that sit inside of the membrane and function as pumps that move molecules back and forth across the membrane. And one of the things, again, that the brain has because it's very special and wants to protect itself, it has pumps that sit inside of that membrane. And even if something dangerous gets inside across that membrane that diffuses across it, that pump can push it right back out as soon as it gets there. So from the perspective of creating a drug used to treat an illness, if we have something that moves across the membrane very quickly, that's wonderful, we're really happy. But what if the pump grabs a hold of it, and then as soon as it gets inside, it just pushes it right on back out? The drug will not be there long enough to actually do the function that we need it to do in the brain, and that's not useful for to us. So if this is the case, if this is going to happen, if these pumps are gonna grab a hold of our drug compounds, we need to know about this. So what we can actually do is use a similar system, again, this two-compartment system that sits in our 96-well plate, to try and test that. Except that this time, instead of on that support system, instead of having a membrane that we artificially create, we coat it with cells. And what we do is actually coat it with the real cells that coat the endothelial, uh, the endothelial vessels inside of your brain and put them in a nice, solid, tight layer on top of that solid support. This is a layer of cells. This makes up our artificial blood-brain barrier. And then we do the same thing. We have a compartment that represents the outside of the brain. We have the cells that make up the blood-brain barrier. And then we have a compartment that represents the inside of the brain. 
and we can again test how quickly something goes across that barrier. So we have our drug candidate compound, we push it across the membrane, and we see how quickly it moves. And if we determine that this actually is not very permeable for a compound that we predicted to be very permeable when looking at the membrane alone, then we might suspect that, okay, this gets across the membrane really quickly, but it doesn't get across the cells. And that suggests to us that maybe there's a pump that's grabbing a hold of that compound and pushing it back out. And if that's the case, that plays a really important role in this pipeline that we've been describing, because we have things that are predicted to be very permeable, things that experimentally we are observed to be very permeable, and then maybe are or are not permeable across cells. And if they are not permeable across cells, they're probably not going to be permeable in the blood-brain barrier, which is itself made up of cells. And so this is really important information that we, provide, that we are provided by doing this cellular assay in terms of weeding out compounds that, again, are not likely to work when we proceed to our animal model. So we have hundreds of compounds that we've started with. We've weeded this down to maybe tens of compounds in our experimental system. We've tested them in membranes. We've tested them in cells, and we're ready to move on to the most accurate, most time and cost intensive model, but the model that is going to give us the best information. This is our in vivo system, our animal model. So this cartoon shows a representation of what the data are looking like in our animal model. And I want to stress that even though this is kind of a cartoon representation, the numbers of the molecules that we're going to show you and their behavior is actually reflective of the real experimental results that we got from testing this compound in an animal model. So we have two different classes of compounds that were tested that we're going to describe to you in a little bit more detail. Tim's going to talk to you a little bit first about the compound on the left. So we started off in this example with the molecule on the left, the green compound. This was given to us by people who had tested it in a test tube without any membranes there, and they said, this works really well. You know, it does its job, it, it's really good. The only problem is it doesn't really get across the membrane very well. So can you take this drug, add something to it, modify it slightly to allow it to get across the membrane, but without without getting rid of its function, without compromising its function. So that, that's what we did. We, we, went, we went through this pipeline. We used the in silico predictions. We used the in vitro testing, and then fully tested it in animals to come up with this yellow compound on the right. So this yellow compound on the other side maybe doesn't work quite as well, but way more of it gets into the brain. It goes through those cells faster. It's much more permeable. And so what we end up with is 20 times as much of that compound on the right inside the brain as we do for the compound on the left. And so even though its activity is reduced by about 50%, we have 20 times as much of it in the brain where it needs to function. So overall, when we consider all of the parameters associated with what we need this drug to do, it's much, much more effective. Yeah. So this was what we did using what we call our drug optimization pipeline. You can start off testing a wide number of dis different possibilities using methods that are, that are very relatively cheap and fast. And you narrow that down to one, one or two single compounds that you have to use your very expensive, very time-consuming test. So by using a pipeline like this, you know, we're, we're, we're getting to the answer uh, at a cheaper cost. We're getting there faster. So we're saving time. We're saving money. And of course, we're saving guinea pigs as well. So, thank you.